Hi, this is Craig Stocks here for Utah Desert Remote Observatories. You can find us online at utahdesertremote.com. And we'd love to talk to you about uh, hosting your telescope under our dark skies. In fact, today, that's one of the things I want to talk about is what is remote astrophotography? What's involved in it? And what do you need to be successful? So remote astrophotography is really just photography or remote imaging uh, when the telescope is somewhere away from you. So you're not, you know, physically in contact with it. Uh, one of the main reasons that you would be interested in remote imaging is to locate your telescope under a, a better sky than what you have where you live. It uh, very likely will be a darker sky. Uh, and also uh, more clear nights. Uh, a lot of people live in areas with not only light pollution, but a lot of cloud structures. And being in the desert, uh, we have quite a few clear nights. Uh, I've imaged since January of 2022, and this is now early December. Uh, I've imaged about 80% of the nights. Uh, not all of those were all night, but at least part of the night, 80% of the time. And that kind of brings me to the second point. Uh, one of the big advantages of remote astrophotography is it separates you from the telescope. So you don't have to be uh, you know, personally involved spending your time with the telescope. Uh, you can automate the imaging sequence, uh, let the telescope do the work, and then you can go do other things, uh, whether it's you know going to meetings, going to uh, a party, going out to dinner, going on a date with your wife. Uh, well, you know, whatever other uh, family work, other uh, constraints you have on your time, you can still do astro imaging and collect data uh, separated from the telescope. And that really lets you leverage that uh, remote location. <music> It's not for everybody. I understand that. Uh, it's not the same as sitting under the stars, you know, sitting next to your telescope, uh, interacting with other people. And if that's the thing that, that attracts you to the hobby of astronomy or astrophotography, uh, I certainly understand that. I say it's, it's not for everybody. Uh, but as they say, it's the difference that makes the difference. And for some people, uh, it is their way of enjoying the, the hobby. And particularly if you, as I mentioned earlier, if you live somewhere where you have poor sky conditions at home uh, or other time commitments, maybe your job doesn't allow you to the freedom to go out at night and uh, spend hours imaging, uh, or maybe you have a, a job or other requirements that require you to travel and be away from home quite a bit. Uh, you know, remote imaging is something you can do from a motel room in the evening uh, in between meetings. So for some people, it's a very good solution. And also I will mention that it's not cheap. Uh, the renting a spot in a remote observatory is generally gonna cost several hundred dollars a month and up. So it's, it's expensive, uh, but for some people, it's the best way to approach the hobby. So if you are one of those people, you'll find this very interesting, I think. Uh, so let's talk about the, the typical architecture. Obviously, you start with a telescope uh, and you put it out in a, in a remote location. And the key that makes this all work is that you have a computer, a PC of some sort attached to that remote computer. And it's going to control the mount, the telescope, the camera, everything just as if you were sitting next to the telescope. The difference is instead of sitting next to the telescope in a remote location, you're sitting next to your computer at home. And the way we connect those together is through some sort of a remote desktop application that operates over the internet. So any place you have internet access, then you can use your computer or smartphone or tablet. And it basically becomes the keyboard and monitor and mouse to control that remote computer, you know, whether it's you know, in your backyard or a thousand miles away, you have that same connection and in effect, you're 
your home computer is the uh, the display and the keyboard and the the mouse controller for the remote computer all of the software really lives on the remote computer so as i mentioned it could be in your backyard or a thousand miles away and the the control concepts are the same uh, what you do need though is a secure site of some sort <clears throat> you need power um, and reliable power and also you need internet uh, those are really the three basic requirements for a remote site. The basic equipment is pretty much the same. You have the optical tube assembly, camera, computer, a mount, a focuser, filter wheel, a rotator, you know, flip flat, all the, the usual kind of uh, accessories that you might use for astro imaging. And I want to just talk a little bit about each one of those because some of them do have uh, a little bit different requirements. For the optical tube assembly, <clears throat> there's really nothing special about that. I think pretty much any optical tube assembly, whether it's a refractor, a reflector, uh, schmidt cassegrain whatever, you know, the only real requirement is that it needs to be able to accept an autofocuser because you won't be sitting next to the, the telescope to focus. So you, you'll need a, uh, an autofocuser of some sort. The camera, uh, again, nothing really special other than it should be an astronomy dedicated camera. Uh, a, a digital SLR is probably not going to be appropriate just because of the power management and all of the different features that you need to control. A dedicated astronomy camera is really designed to be controlled by uh, some sort of a computer control system. Cooled is obviously better <clears throat> and even better yet some of them are cooled and have um, dew heater strips built in to avoid fogging. So that would that would probably be the ideal type of camera. For a computer, uh, most people use a Windows PC uh, and there's a wide variety. There's the, uh, the Eagle style that are kind of an all-in-one solution. Uh, a lot of people are real happy using the uh, Intel Nook style computers, uh, especially with a, a solid state drive built in. You can use a laptop, but uh, as I mentioned here, you want the lid closed because you don't want the light from the display. So there's really nothing special about the computer. Uh, if it works at your house, it would probably work remote. Uh, I will mention though that the ASI Air <clears throat> is not suitable for a remote application. Uh, it does a lot of things really great, but it's just not really designed for remote use in mind. So you need a, a regular full-fledged computer. In terms of the mount, that's probably the most important piece of the equation. And you really want a mount that's suitable for remote use. And what makes it suitable for remote use is, first of all, it would have some sort of a homing function. Uh, the Paramount style mounts have a, uh, an encoder that, the, that you move the mount or the mount moves itself to a home position, finds the, uh, the sensor and then locks into that so that it has a very repeatable homing location. So anytime you turn on the mount or cycle power or if it needs to be reset, it can find its home position and then it knows how it's oriented relative to the sky. Now the higher end mounts that have uh, absolute encoders provide basically that same functionality through the encoders. <clears throat> but you want to avoid mounts that need to be manually homed. That You don't want something that you have to you know, manually move the mount to a, a home position and then start it up uh, because you, know, you won't be there to do that. So the homing function is probably the most important thing to look for in a mount. I mentioned earlier that you do need an autofocuser uh, because you need to focus without touching the telescope. Uh, there's lots of different uh, autofocuser options and I think almost any of them, if they work with the optical tube assembly that you have, then it will probably work. Filter wheel, again, kind of obvious. You, you won't be there to change filters, so you do want a filter wheel. Camera rotator is nice to have because it lets you rotate to different position angles. So it really allows the optimal framing of the targets when you're not there, again, to physically rotate the camera. <clears throat> Note that it does complicate flat frames. That, uh, Generally, your flat frames will need to match the uh, rotation angle of the camera unless you have a, a very symmetrical system. So 
as you rotate the camera for different targets, you will need to take flat frames that match that same rotation angle. And that's where if something like a flip flat is also a nice to have. Again, it's not a necessity, but it is a dual purpose accessory. Uh, it provides not only a flats panel uh, to, for taking flats during the day, but it also provides a dust cover, which, which can help depending on the uh, location. Some additional equipment that if you're in a hosted type facility, uh, in some places the host may provide these. In some cases, you'll want to provide your own. But a remote power switch is, uh, is almost a necessity. And the most common one is made by digital loggers and it's called either the Pro Switch or the Web Power Switch. I've seen it under different names. But it's basically an outlet strip that connects to the local network so that you can turn the individual outlets on and off remotely. And that lets you do things like power cycle, the, uh, the 12 volt supply or the mount uh, or the camera uh, and not only control the, whether the power is on and off, but sometimes it allows you to reset those things uh, if they need reset. Uh, they run about $200, I think. Uh, you may need <coughs> some sort of an unmanaged ethernet switch and what this basically does is act as a splitter for your Ethernet cable. Um, you typically would have one Ethernet cable coming to the, the pier where you're located. And if you have more than one device, such as the, uh, the Pro Switch in your computer and possibly camera and other devices that all need Internet connections, then you would go through this Ethernet switch in order to distribute the Ethernet to multiple devices that are associated with your telescope. And lastly, you may want a small uh, uninterruptible power supply or UPS or battery backup, depending on your terminology. Uh, you don't need a big one necessarily, but you do want something that will smooth the power uh, if there's power is interrupted temporarily or until the backup generator comes on, which would typically be 10 to 30 seconds of runtime. Now, if you're more into the do-it-yourself uh, remote observatory, and you can certainly do it, but you know there are a lot of things that you need to provide, starting with a, a concrete foundation for your telescope. Uh, we have foundations that are about six to 8,000 pounds of concrete for each telescope. You need a physical observatory enclosure. Uh, obviously, you need reliable power. <clears throat> There's a lot of remote sites uh, that are available if you're looking at land. A lot of them don't have power or even access to power. Uh, and Besides power, if you're really using it remotely, uh, you probably want some sort of an automatic backup generator uh, so that you can open and close the roof even if the power is out. Uh, as I mentioned before, you need high-speed internet. Uh, if you're using satellite-type internet or cellular internet, uh, you'll just need to dial back your expectations because you won't have the bandwidth for file downloads and uh, for controlling the computer, you may have a little bit more lag time uh, between the, you know, moving your mouse and seeing the mouse move on the screen. You're probably going to want a separate computer to control the observatory. So you'll have a, a computer for imaging and a computer for controlling the observatory. <clears throat> and that's probably going to be connected to some sort of a local area network. So you can share data between the observatory computer and your imaging computer. So for instance, you know the status of the roof or the uh, weather conditions. You obviously need a, a physical roof opener. Uh, most popular devices are like garage door openers or a gate opener to physically open the roof. And then you need a controller, uh, which is a combination of both hardware and software to control that opener. Uh, and then very likely that roof control system is going to be integrated with a weather monitoring system so that the roof controller knows what the weather is and it can automatically close the roof if clouds come in or if the wind kicks up or if the humidity goes up uh, so that you have that, that safety of the roof automatically closing. You're going to need equipment to monitor uh, your cameras. So for instance, uh, you know, there are times when you just need to look at your telescope and, and figure out where is it actually pointed because things don't seem like they're working correctly. So having a, a camera to be able to see what's happening is really useful. An all-sky camera lets you visualize the sky that's not over your head. 
real handy to have. Sky quality meter that measures how dark the sky is. Uh, that's probably a nice to have, not a need to have. Uh, but a seeing monitor uh, is a, a good, it's almost a necessity. It can tell you something about clouds that are moving in and also whether the seeing is good or bad that night. So if you're having trouble with guiding and you look at the seeing monitor and see that the seeing is particularly bad, that may be the reason that your guiding is not so good. And then lastly is just on-site hands-on support. If this is somewhere away from your backyard, if you need a, uh, a button pushed or a knob turned or a cable unplugged or plugged back in, yeah, having somebody there who can do that for you remotely is extremely valuable uh, when you're not able to do it yourself. And of course, that's why people use services like the Utah Desert Remote Observatories is because we provide all of those things for you. So let's expand a little bit on the typical architecture and the way the uh, software works. <clears throat> I talked earlier about using a remote PC that basically has all of the software that you would use to control your telescope as if you were sitting next to it. So that would be a mount controller, a camera controller, a filter wheel, auto guider, focuser, rotator, flip flat, all of those things that, uh, that you would normally control on your computer uh, all of that software is mount, is installed on the remote PC. And then the way to really leverage that in a remote location is using ASCOM to tie everything together. And then a session manager of some sort so that the session manager through ASCOM or direct connections connects to all these different uh, devices on your, on your computer and on your telescope to control them for you. Now, in my situation, what I use is Voyager as the session controller. Uh, some people use Nina or SGP. Uh, any of those will work for you. And then through the ASCOM platform, that is connected either directly or through the platform to the mount controller is the SkyX. Uh, I'm using the ASI camera driver, uh, an ASCOM filter wheel control, uh, PHD2 for auto guiding which then is also connected to its own camera and has its own connection to the telescope, to the mount. Uh, ASCOM focuser, uh, ASCOM connection to the Pegasus rotator, and then a connection to the, uh, the Alnatec flip-flat. So that all lives on the remote PC. And the last thing you install on the remote PC is some sort of a remote desktop application I've been real happy with Google Remote Desktop. It's, it's easy to set up and it just kind of works. So once that's configured and you're logged into Google on the uh, remote computer, you can then go to your home computer and install a Google Remote Desktop app on your home computer. And then over the internet, that Google Remote Desktop communicates from your home computer to the remote computer and then through that, you're able to control all of these different uh, programs and applications and devices on the remote system. And it's, it's kind of that simple. There's a little bit of uh, knob fiddling and uh, you know, finding all the right settings to make it all work. Uh, so there's a little bit of a learning curve, but it is pretty straightforward. And conceptually, that's the way it all ties together. So the last thing you need to accomplish is some sort of file transfer because all the imaging is happening on the remote computer. And generally you wanna get those files uploaded to your home computer. And the way I do that is just by using a Dropbox shared folder. Uh, I have a shared folder set up on the remote PC that's shared with a folder on my home computer. And then <clears throat> as it's imaging, those files get transferred to the home computer. So when I get up in the morning, the files are sitting there waiting for me. So that's kind of the, uh, the nuts and bolts, ins and outs of remote imaging. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Just drop them in the, uh, the comments down below and I'll be happy to try to address them. And of course, you can find us online at utahdesertremote.com. And we do have a, uh, a contact page there so you can get in touch with us if you have any other questions. Or of course, if you're interested in either uh, 
uh, hosting your telescope at our site. Uh, or we also offer hourly rentals on our equipment if you're just interested in, uh, in renting some time to go after a particular target. So get in touch with us. Be happy to uh, talk to you. Uh, I hope you have a great day today and an even better night tonight under a clear, dark sky. Thanks.